Good evening. My name is Dan Plesch. And I'm the director of the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy. Welcome to this evening's talk and book launch by colleague and friend, Professor Tom Weiss from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, only a few blocks from the UN headquarters itself. Um, his work is partly a set text for us students, um, but I say his book, his most recent book, uh, I think probably he's written more books than I've had hot dinners. Um, <laughs> certainly I don't, uh, can't turn around without another one uh, coming out. Um, uh, after an illustrious career at the UN, but also at Brown, uh, many years ago now, he joined the Graduate Institute um, and for a long time ran the Ralph Bunch Center um, and there amongst other things he led the UN Intellectual History Project which <laughs> clearly is one of a, a shine clearly. a bright light yeah, yeah, yeah. upon the United Nations system <laughs> uh, and in the spirit of shining spotlights uh, he uh, has continued to, to write on the UN system, the UN uh, development program in particular, uh, the uh, great Brian Urquhart, um, who was a, a UN undersecretary and uh, founder and architect of UN peacekeeping, uh, introduced us because Brian took a shine to one of my books. Uh, and as a result, Tom and I uh, had a partnership bringing him to SOAS for several years. Uh, looking together at lessons from the forgotten UN before the UN, and that had a number of uh, fun publications. Um, since then, we've uh, continued to work in parallel, and his most recent work um, is, Would the World Be Better Without the UN? Well, clearly, uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Bolton think so, uh, although nevertheless, they turn up or at least Mr. Trump turned it's up, and that maybe yeah. that's a... Bolton did too. And Bolton did too, so there's a story there, uh, as we've discussed a little in class. Um, the foreword uh, is by the late and very much lamented Kofi Annan, with whom Tom worked a good deal. Um, and I think Tom will talk with us for uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, about his work and findings and so on, and then we've got a ch chance to have a good half an hour's uh, at least uh, discussion interaction and the two of us will then in the modern form sit in the comfy chairs with the microphones and bring you all into the discussion uh, so without more ado i will vacate the platform and ask you to welcome tom thank you thanks dan for the excessively kind words of introduction no, but I, I frequently ask myself um, how one of my two irreverent daughters would introduce me. It undoubtedly would be somewhat different. Um, in fact, many years ago when the, the older one, who's now an economic consultant, was about 12 years old and she was in her room and I had forgotten something. I was leaving for the airport and I ran back upstairs to uh, um, pick up the papers. And I hear this voice behind the door. She was with a friend. You know, I really don't know what he does. And I have no idea why anyone would pay him to say anything. I would pay him to keep quiet. So we'll see. Tonight's question, would the world be better without the UN? This is actually, uh, for me, a, a fairly existential question. Um, I started in preparing the, the first time I gave a similar talk. I started, I'm mathematically challenged, but I started counting backwards. And I figured out that actually I was conceived while a San Francisco conference was in session in 1945. And I was actually born early in 1946 when the first sessions of the GA and the Security Council were meeting here in London. Um, and my entire career, both as a professional in the Secretariat uh, and then as a head of an NGO doing work on UN issues, and then as a 
fuzzy headed academic for about the last 30 years, has revolved around the behavior and misbehavior of the UN. So, to accompany this question this evening, I thought I'd add a second one. Uh, would the world be better without Donald Trump? Now, the answers to the two questions actually are, are related. Uh, and the information that I try to put in this book, the stories I try to tell, I'd like to think are a modest way of uh, answering the second one, to which the answer is an unequivocal yes. And it's not just an onslaught against the UN, it's against anything multilateral. So I'll be going back and forth between the two. So, um, and we do have this modest thing called an election next Tuesday, which um, I'm feeling a tad optimistic, but nonetheless uneasy about. Um, we can talk about that later. But um, Trump's remarks frequently disparage the UN as mostly a waste of money. Uh, and, but this is accompanied by his aversion, frankly, to collaborative decision making in any format. Um, so what I'd like to try to do is um, provide a short summary of the book, but then put Trump's comments in September of 2017 and September of 2018 in front of the General Assembly in a bit of a context uh, referring to the work that Dan and I did together on the wartime United Nations when there was a different kind of threat uh, and a, certainly a different kind of U.S. leadership. And then I'll end up with a few words about what I think may be happening on First Avenue in, in, in New York. Well, answering this question, actually, frankly, it should have been done at any time in the last almost three quarters of a century, but it, it really, really is much more critical in the age of Trump or the age of Brexit and the age of a lot of other people. Uh, uh, and it's particularly important now that the third national security advisor, John Bolton, is appointed, who made uh, quite a well-earned re reputation for being an enfant terrible in New York uh, when he served for not quite two years as the un, um, unapproved uh, by the Senate uh, permanent representative of the United States in New York. Um, both of them sneer at international institutions of any time. Allies or partnerships are irrelevant in a zero-sum world. Uh, and my argument will be, uh, frankly, that uh, the approach is not only ahistorical, it's also wrong. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to concentrate on the UN, but this is really a much more broader, much broader gauge attack on international institutions, multilaterals in whatever form. Security organizations, NATO is obsolete or cost too much, and they don't fare much better than cooperative arrangements of any time, economic ones. So disparages the European Union, tears up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, disparages NAFTA, the World Trade Organization is next on the horizon. And these efforts are actually um, proceeding either without the United States or under active attack by the United States. But the discrete cooperative actions, the Paris Agreement or the Global Compact on Migration, uh, withdraw from those. And informal arrangements, the group of seven, the group of 20, are now the group of seven minus one or the group of 20 minus one. And in fact, the minimal definition of a multilateral effort would be three, and NAFTA actually wasn't even that. It was two sets of bilateral negotiations. So uh, in case you, apparently the book will be sold later, but in case you're not going to read it this evening, the answer is on page 190. Um, and the answer actually, as I said, it considered no. But I ask an honest question. And what I try to do in the two parts of the book is generate some, not alternative facts, but uncomfortable facts for both foes and friends of the UN. 
So as uh, I, I, this book and in the, in the class tomorrow morning, I try to focus on the two main outputs of the UN. The universal body that sets standards, ideas, norms, and then an operational one, which has a, is in a lot of countries, I think in too many countries. But the, it's important to keep those two sets of uh, products, outputs, uh, distinct, and the book tries to do that. But then there's a two by three matrix, so you've got the ideas and operations, and then across the top are the three main kinds of activities, international peace and security, human rights and humanitarian action, and the third one being sustainable development. So, part one of the book consists of really specific illustrations on how the world would have been a much worse place at several junctures over the last seven decades without the UN system. This part of my argument is designed certainly for the, uh, the administration, or the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, a host of other people um, who attack the rules-based order that the U.S. helped put together and has nourished, frankly, uh, over the last uh, seven decades. So I say, well, kind of, what's the evidence? There's lots in there, but let me just tick off a few. That without the first UN of member states and without the second UN of leaders and international civil servants, where would we be without the, the campaign in 1977 to eliminate smallpox or the current ones, a guinea worm and, and, and polio? Uh, the efforts over the years to formulate women's rights, or at least getting them on the, on the agenda in San Francisco and subsequently in the Universal Declaration and elsewhere, or to deliver humanitarian assistance uh, in the DRC or Sudan, uh, kept the peace on the Golan Heights or Cyprus. Actually, in the early years, they facilitated decolonization and a whole set of development norms and ideas to make a stab at protecting cultural heritage in war zones, prosecuting war criminals, and the, and the list goes on. So that's the first part of the book. But the second part of the book, with a kind of parallel structure, involves a second counterfactual. And this is for cheerleaders with blue pom-poms uh, in UN associations uh, across the planet. Um, because the debits on the UN's ledger are also substantial. So, the planet could have been a whole lot better on numerous occasions as well, with a little better behavior by those member states and international civil service. Uh, you know, if the Security Council had not been quite as hypocritical in 1994 in Rwanda, or at present in Syria and Yemen and Myanmar, and the list goes on. Or if peacekeepers had maybe raped fewer kids in Central Africa or spread less cholera in Haiti. Um, if more competent and dedicated staff had actually performed better in field operations or even in research had monitored far more objectively and, and occasionally called a spade a shovel on the performance of member states. If there were fewer inter-organizational turf battles over resources, and this operation actually operated more cohesively. In short, the second counterfactual explores what would have happened if the 193 currently member states had behaved a little more responsibly and the 100,000 or so civil servants and about the same number of soldiers and, and police had been more creative, more competent, more courageous. So when I wrote the proposal to write this book uh, to the Carnegie Corporation, which is generously supported it. I really was aiming at a book coming out next year for the, the 75th anniversary, 220. Uh, and after the elections, I simply felt I had to write it more quickly. And still in the United States, there are lots of criticism, xenophobia, racism, corruption, tax benefits for the rich, tax on the environment, tax on the Constitution. Multilateralism still 
doesn't actually fit on anyone's list. Uh, and um, not that this book is necessarily going to get it anywhere, but this is a traditional problem in the United States that it's hard to get multilateral issues on anyone's agenda. Uh, if you go back and look at the debates between Clinton and Trump, the word UN never appeared. And it, was, it appeared once in the previous debates when Obama was on the stage. So uh, it seems to me that if you take a look at the first year, 2017, it began with cutting completely the funds to the Population Fund, part of the UN that works on uh, women and girls' reproductive health. It ended the year with the official withdrawal from UNESCO. And in between, uh, we saw pulling out of the Paris Agreements and reneging on the commitment to the Green Climate Fund, pulling out of the Global Compact on Migration. And then at the end of the year, just for um, good measure, uh, in the Security Council, the US vetoed a resolution that suggested that maybe moving the capital to Jerusalem was not the greatest of ideas. And then when the, the General Assembly said the same thing, the initial reaction was to get rid of the final contribution for uh, 217 to the uh, Relief and Works Agency for Palestine. And then 2018 has hardly been a, a better vintage uh, with, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, well, I didn't mention that, the, the, the bias cesspool of the UN, uh, the, the Human Rights Council, that's Nikki Haley's description, a lot of that. Rip up the P5 plus one agreement on Iran. Uh, now going to zero for UNRWA from, uh, from 360 million to zero. Uh, and we still have, you know, a couple of months to go, so stay tuned. So. My modest hope here is that some of what's in this book uh, will contribute to a conversation about the importance of multilateralism in the United States, because my sense is that the, that the shots across the bow in 217 and 218 uh, could become broadsides uh, in, a, in a much more serious way. Uh, and certainly, if you think about the G7 or NATO summits from last year and the tantrums that were thrown there, um, and if any ruling of the World Trade Organization goes against the United States. So the UN is not a four-letter word. It's merely a two-letter invective. So with that as a bit of an introduction to what's in the book, I thought I'd try to put in context um, Trump's first two presentations. Dan, you mentioned uh, Brian Urquhart, dear guy. Uh, and when I was interviewing him for the intellectual history, uh, somewhere toward the end of it, uh, I said, well, you've been in this bloody thing 40 years. What is the real problem? And, and Brian said, Tom, my friend, uh, the UN is the last bastion of state sovereignty. And this year, as we look at the 40th anniversary of the Declaration on Human Rights, there's been a, a bit of erosion uh, to, to, to Brian. Uh, that is, the, the usual presidents, prime ministers, and princes who claim that whatever they do at home is okay behind borders. We've begun to, at least on occasion, make inroads on that. The responsibility to protect which I had something to do with. On occasion, we removed the um, permission slip for sovereign thugs. And one should keep in mind that there are almost 600 treaties, international treaties, that are undeposited at the UN. And in any case, uh, countries, uh, whether we're talking about financial transfers, technology, information, certain kinds of invasions are a little difficult to resist. So sovereignty ain't what it used to be. We go back to the first speech that Trump gave in, to UN. Uh, he's a redundant speaker, but 21 times he used the word state sovereignty, sacrosanct state sovereignty. Now, if you had been there, the biggest applause actually came from Russia and China and Myanmar and Venezuela and Sudan, and the list goes on. Because these countries 
in the past <laughs> have used state sovereignty as a way to fend off criticisms from Washington. That's no longer necessary. And you don't actually happen, I'm not one, happen to have to be an Obama groupie to go back and read any of his speeches. His first speech to the UN had mentioned the word sovereignty once, and that was in the context of saying how US national interests could be served by utilizing international organizations, in particular the UN. So, um, I, I'm reminded of a, a quote by Samuel Johnson who says it's kind of wrapping yourself in the flag as the last refuge of scoundrels. Um, and it also flies in the face of problem solving of virtually <laughs> any important issue from uh, terrorism to weapons of mass destruction and the list goes on. So the power of one to do much about that is truly limited. Hence, I'm hoping the contents of this book will be of some significance. Now, I'm not the first person to point this out, but, but it's interesting go, to go back and look at the origins of America first. Uh, Actually, the shortest lived, best financed anti war movement of all time happened to be have led by three proto fascists Charles Lindbergh, Henry Ford, and Father Coughlin, uh, who established this group to keep the US out of World War II. Um, that committee lasted about 11 months. Uh, it collapsed uh, after Pearl Harbor. Trump's version has not as yet. I, it will, and I hope without the equivalent of December 1941. That said, I tr try to point out that the organization's limitations, not only its sovereignty bound constitution, but also the atomized nature of and wasteful nature of many of its operations should be as obvious to anyone else. So before getting to the Secretary General's, uh, what he's trying to do in New York, I wanted to take a minute to go back to the wartime history because, um, as I said, Trump and Bolton have never met an ally or an organization that they liked. But history has other lessons for us here. Um, and so for me, it's important to think about the conditions under which U.S. interests were served by a different approach in the face of a different kind of existential threat, namely fascism. Uh, so as we point out in this, in this book on the wartime origins of the organization, the, 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 the origins were actually on the 1st of January 1942, not June. Uh, of 1945 or the conferences leading up to it. Um, when 26 allies, later 44, pooled efforts to crush Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. But along with that commitment, military commitment, came a longer term commitment to international cooperation, collaboration, as the best way to guarantee post-war peace and stability and prosperity. So what we tried to do in this book, and the reason I'm returning to it, is that one has to keep in mind that the UN was not simply a, a, a way to put in evidence military might in, in North Africa and, and Europe and Asia, but it was a commitment to follow up with international obligations. So this powerful mixture of realism and call it a lot of things, but we call it idealism, uh, was really important. And in looking through the documents and looking at what was happening in Washington and Whitehall and lots of other places, it wasn't simply crushing fascism. I mean, that was the primary purpose. But lots of other issues were on the table. Decolonization, international criminal justice, post-war reconstruction, refugee assistance, international development, regulating the world economy, 
agriculture and educational policy, and the list goes on. So those wartime planners, unlike the current gang, uh, rejected unilateral military might and, uh, and diplomacy uh, and lawlessness as policy options. So to make a long story short, San Francisco was not um, uh, peripheral but central to U.S. decision making. And so while we said in this book that one might have expected the fact that the league fell flat on its face to have led to sort of realism, Hobbes on st steroids, it didn't. It led to the, the rule of law, not going it alone, and not the law of the jungle, but multilateralism and the rule of law. So the solution was not 1914 minus, but 1918 plus to build on the successes, and there were some of the league, and try to do it better the next time. So while normally speaking, one says, ah, that's those, it's those Canadas and Koreas, it's the kind of middle powers of the world that are really, really interested in multilateral cooperation uh, and major powers, unilateralism. There are times at which, in fact, when the conditions are right and the leadership is right, collaboration is actually the best way to go. And my argument is, in fact, we are and have been for some time a spot in which Many, not all, but many uh, problems that are dear to the United States need to be approached in a multilateral fashion. So, what are the implications of America first on First Avenue? The place to begin, of course, is that, um, alas, uh, Trump is not alone on this stage. You folks have your Brexit, but we can, it's also the age of Putin and Erdogan, and Xi, and Modi, and Duterte, recently Bolsonaro, El Sisi, Maduro, and O'Brien, and the list goes on and on. So there is actually an unfortunate and ugly shift to the right. But the United States has, <laughs> has an unusual ability to wreak political and financial havoc in the UN. And so we need to pay attention to uh, the actions of the Trump administration. So as always, there's an argument about, oh, you know, saving money. Uh, so the population fund, $70 million. The US tr said, well, we gotta save on, we've gotta save a billion dollars on peacekeeping. And it ended up being about 600 million. So the US portion of that is about 170 million. Uh, and even if you throw in all of UNRWA, you're talking about a rounding error in a US budget. But this really has legs domestically. And of course, the implications of this are that how, what do Moscow and Beijing think about saving money? Well, the best way to save money for peacekeeping is get rid of any human rights dimensions in peacekeeping operations, which is what they're now proposing. It may, in fact, be some of the parallel efforts um, out, kind of outside the UN that may be the most toxic. Um, on trade, um, and not just the TPP and threatening NAFTA, but steel tariffs and aluminum tariffs and et cetera, really, really play directly into the hands of China and Russia. I mean, their, their foreign policy for years have been to divide the West. Uh, they don't no longer have to do this for themselves. They have uh, somebody in Washington doing that work for them. I think it's Beijing that's made the most of this opportunity to date presented somewhat on a silver platter. Um, they can better dictate the standards of investment and, and uh, production on Asia. They pick up new trading partners uh, and uh, you know, they've be now become the voice for reason and stability uh, somewhat um, uh, counterintuitively. Uh, and if you look at the Paris Agreement, um, really China has been the direct beneficiary of this myopia. Uh, leading advocate for 
controlling climate change, ironically, as they become the biggest producer of greenhouse gases. And in several cities, if you visit there, you're not supposed to breathe in them. Uh, so, uh, but they're you know, controlling the world market, three quarters of the solar panels. They've actually made some huge steps on urban pollution. Meanwhile, uh, dear uh, President Trump uh, is getting rid of um, environmental regulations and talking about jobs in coal mines. So this is certainly not going to make America great again. It's likely to make it poor, more polluted again. I think there is some hope next week, and certainly in the 220 elections, in the sense that the next elections, presidential elections, occur a few days before the U.S. could legally pull out of the Paris Agreement. And there is lots of activity, U.S. cities, U.S. states, U.S. corporations, who have committed themselves to um, respecting the commitments on the Paris Agreement. So I'm somewhat hopeful that this thing will still be intact when a different administration comes on board. So, so what, what are the prospects that the UN will not become a relic? Um, well, reform has been a topic that has been discussed basically since the ink was drying on the charter in uh, June of uh, 1945. So the efforts to make it more inclusive, more transparent, more accountable, to pull together the atomized parts of the system uh, have been going on forever. My own evaluation is that the results are far more modest than they should be. But the decimal, decimal, the decimal levels of criticism um, are increasing, and it's not just in Washington. Um, last year, I did an a, a evaluation of Swedish funding to the United Nations system, Sweden, bless them. Um, you know, our sort of, there was no UN project that wasn't uh, likely to get their favor. That has changed. There's a far more sort of cost-benefit transactional approach, even in Stockholm, among the parliamentarians, journalists, and the public. And it seems to me that the multilateral narrative, if it has less traction in Stockholm, it has much less traction in Washington. And so one, I think, needs to ask the kinds of questions I'm asking in this book, um, to think about what, what would the world look like without the UN? And you can do lots of transactional analyses of the UN. Just to take a couple, uh, if you go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you look at the documents, both Kennedy and Khrushchev see Utan's diplomacy as a crucial variable in the conversation to end that crisis. That wasn't the only variable, of course, but I'm sort of, do we really want to test the proposition that having this kind of capacity around is a bad idea? And if you want to be transactional, the record-breaking $8 billion of peacekeeping operations last year, uh, that was about two weeks of the Iraq war in the middle of the last decade. Or what about the smallpox? If you go back and look, the total cost of the smallpox eradication program run by WHO was $300 million. Actually, only $100 million of that was the WHO money. Of that, only about $35 million was U.S. money. And over the years, the 40 years since that time, it would be, I don't quite know how to do this, but one could come up with a rather large uh, positive balance sheet in terms of savings of administration alone, let alone vaccines, let alone the people not marred by it. So I think we need to emphasize the value for money of UN operations. So in comes um, Antonio Guterres. Um, I frankly have, and have written such, have been disappointed uh, to date. Um, he's 40% into his mandate of five years. Um, 
I think some hard questions about the UN's comparative advantage need to be asked. I think there is definitely a role for the UN in structuring conversations uh, about global problems. Being operational in only a few places, uh, I think really, um, whatever you want to call, um, conflict-prone uh, uh, countries. So fewer operations with uh, more concentration on the operational side, doing the universal side for standards, norms, um, and, and conversations about um, the global comments. Um, it's the, the waste, and here I always get into trouble, I think that I'm coming from here, the, the waste, the overlap, the lack of synergy in the UN and the system of organizations is substantial. Uh, and my initial hope was that Guterres, who had actually run a pretty tight shop at the, as High Commissioner uh, for Refugees in Geneva, had slimmed things down, had outsourced a whole number of things, had earned a reputation. Um, I thought he was going to do some of the same, at least at the new in New York. That has not happened as yet. I've not to lost total hope that somebody who understands the structural flaws the way he does and staffing shortcomings will attack this problem head on. And in fact, here may be the silver lining, I think he could actually use the uh, Trump administration's tightening of screws to actually do things that everyone, or everyone, commissions, academics, and journalists have said needed to be done for a very long period of time. So I'm going to end and I'm now with uh, you know, the, the uh, frequently cited uh, remark of Doug Hammarskjöld that the UN was not created to get humanity to heaven, but to save it from hell. And I try to keep in mind, and I'd like you guys to keep in mind as well, that the, one of the reasons we're not in the netherworld <laughs> already uh, have been the positive contributions of this institution. Um, but a world without the UN is not unimaginable, particularly if current political conditions continue or, or worsen. And in fact, I think one of the perhaps more insidious threats is that the UN has become so embedded that it, it's taken for granted. And uh, Kevin Rudd, the former Australian uh, uh, prime minister, wrote a while back he said, you know, we're barely conscious of the continuing stabilizing role it, the UN, plays in setting the broad parameters for the conduct of international relations. And he says, if the UN one day disappears or more likely slides into neglect, which is, I think, what's happening, it is only then that we would become fully aware of the gaping hole this would leave in what remained of the post-World War II order. So my argument is warts and all, and I, I guess I present the all in the warts in part one and part two. Um, go to the last line of Trump's 217 remarks to the GA, and he said, we are calling for a great reawakening of nations. He somehow overlooked the fact that uh, the organization was created to curb the demonstrated horrors of nations and of nationalism run amok. Uh, so I don't think he'll say it, but somebody else will say it soon, that we really need a great reawakening of the United Nations. So let me stop there and hope that this will stimulate a few questions. Okay.